doesn't exist. You have to deal with the small tuna that you're catching. And the government says, Ernesto, the sooner those five fishermen disappear, the, the better it is. Because we want two fishing inspectors to leave Esperance and go to Gerald. So please don't help me. And I said to the fishermen, nobody's going to help you unless you help yourselves. You need to find another market for your tuna. And they said, there's no other market. There's no other market. So how do you know there is no other market? We fishermen, exactly. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know if there is another market. So what do you, we have to, you have to do marketing research. You say, we don't know how to do that. I know that you are not. But we need to pay somebody to do a marketing research to find another market for your tuna. How much would it cost to do marketing research? Uh -uh. That's a wrong question. Because the marketing research can cost anything. How much money do you have? Us! Yeah, how much money you want to spend to try to save yourselves. So they look at each other, $200 each, to do an international marketing research. <laughs> Fine. So they put $200 each for the first time in their history, because they never worked together. They drank together, they helped each other at sea, but never, ever, ever put money together to do anything to help, to help collectively, to help themselves. So they put a thousand dollars in a bank account. I go to the Minister for Fisheries and say, you remember the factory you opened in, in Esperance? We're going to get some boats out of that. Give me a thousand dollars. So now we had two thousand dollars. And I found a guy in East Perth, again, was a, a Kiwi guy, 32 years old, never seen a tuna in his life before. Bring him down to Esper to say, you understand marketing, speak to these guys. And David Leaf looks at them and says, have you ever spoken to a Japanese? They said, what for? The fishery department told us that our tuna is too small to be eaten as sushi and sashimi. And David said, have you ever spoken to a Japanese? Where the hell are we going to find a Japanese? We've never seen a Japanese. <laughs> We are in the middle of the Nala world, we are in the middle of nowhere Australia. We've never seen a Japanese. I said, listen, there are millions of them. <laughs> you want a Japanese? I'll find you Japanese. <laughs> so, one Japanese restaurant had opened up in Perth, the first one, by the railway station. I can't remember the name of the street. I walk in there and I said, do you have a chef who speaks English? Oh, a little bit of English. TAFE College gave me a little bit of money, a free ticket. We created a fake class in Japanese fish preparation, all fake, to get this Japanese guy to come to us. And we give him a, a 25 kilo of fish. The guy slices it and says, this is sushi, this is sashimi. And John Totadel says, no, that's not sashimi. And the guy said, I beg your pardon, I'm Japanese, I'm chef. This is sashimi. You mean you make sashimi with small tuna? 20 kilos tuna? The guy said, yes. We prefer toro, a very fat, big one. But since toro is very expensive, every day in Japan we eat this. <laughs> you mean you would buy our tuna for your restaurant? The guy said, yeah, now I'm buying frozen Indonesian yellowtail. This is fresh southern bluefin, which is much better. How much would you pay for our tuna? They'd be paid 60 cents a kilo. The guy said, I can only give you what I paid for the Indonesian tuna. No, no, $3.80 a kilo. Imagine somebody said to you, I can only give you six times what you're making now. Don't be greedy. <laughs> Six times you can make it now. The fishermen went crazy. They turned to David, who had never seen a tuna in his life, and said, David, we are fishermen. We hate going to sell. We love to be at, at sea. Will you sell our fish on commission? David goes home, speaks to his wife, resigned from his federal job, set up a company called Lewin Star, Western Australian Tuna Supplies, goes to all the Japanese restaurants in Australia, goes to Singapore, and then we send five fish to Japan, where the Japanese auction each tuna. 
and the fax comes back, a Japanese distributor wants to meet you, and the representative from the largest fishing company in the world, Taiyo Kyokyo, comes to Esperance, and they say, we want to distribute all your catch. First year, 150 pounds sold at auction, $15 a kilo average. So then the farmers come to see me in Esperance, and they say, if those idiots of fishermen have done that, we farmers should be ashamed of ourselves. We never work together, we never add value, we never market. Can you help us? So 50 farmers come together in a collective. They come up with their own money to study what to do with their mutton. 27 farmers come and, and they want to revegetate the native land and they employ a radical greenie, an environmentalist called Keith Bradley, to help them to do that. <coughs> and in a year, I had 27 projects. And everybody says, screaming to the miracle, a town is dying. How do, did you find all this energy? And I said, well, I listen. I shut up and listen. Nobody had done that. None of what has happened in Ashburn was my idea. I simply facilitated that. And the government in Western Australia said, do it. We like what you do. Do it. So I became a consultant of government for eight years, trained 16 of these people. Um, trained people in Victoria, in New Zealand. Uh, I went to America, professor of, of uh, rural development said, oh my God, this is so interesting. Why don't you come to America? I wrote a book when I was in Minnesota, uh, went back to Western Australia, then I went back to America, and now I live in California for the last 14, 15 years. And we've done this in 300 communities around the world. We have helped to start some 30,000 new businesses. I was invited back to Esperance to celebrate 20 years of enterprise facilitation. They have helped to start 800 businesses in Esperance. So, I know nothing about business. <laughs> Never studied business. And when all these accolades, when people started to tell me how good my work was, I thought, maybe there is this something on this entrepreneurship stuff that maybe I should understand. <coughs> because everybody's telling me that what I'm doing is business development. And I never, I don't understand anything about business. So, for the first time in my life, in 1986, I remember clearly, I bought myself a business magazine. <laughs> Fortune. <laughs> Got this glossy from this kiosk somewhere, St. George's Terrace. And on the cover, there was the face of an entrepreneur. By the way, they're all male. If you see these magazines, it's always a man on the cover. So, it's really strange because 60% of all new businesses in America is created by women. So how come it's always men? So, I open this magazine and I read the story inside the magazine about this face. And all of a sudden, oh my God. <gasps> This is a real entrepreneur. <laughs> My God! <laughs> Silicon Valley was in full bloom and is 24 years old. Genius with the product. Fantastic with marketing. Superb with finance. I was always, I always had to find somebody in Esperance to help my poor, entrepreneurially challenged people. <laughs> the fish, they could only do one thing, fish. I had to find David to sell it. And the wife of one of the fishermen was a CPA. And we dragged her away from the bank to come around the company. And she made five, she had to administer $5.4 million in the first year. 
But the fishermen by themselves, they were useless. I had to find somebody to market it, somebody to look after the money. Maury, he could do it, he could sell it. I had to get the accountant to stop him from committing financial suicide. <laughs> and everybody, everybody came to me. I could never find somebody who passionately, equally loved to do it, to sell it, and to look after the money. So I was doing these marriages of convenience for what I thought was this incapable, you know, entrepreneurially challenged rural people. And when I started to read these magazines about real entrepreneurs, oh my God, I was so impressed that I thought one day, if I keep working with all these second-class people, one day, maybe a real entrepreneur will come and talk to me. Because these guys that I'm working with, they really, they're not entrepreneurs. Yeah, they're running company, they're making money. <coughs> Lots of money. But, you know, compared to these people. And something, strange started to happen. Not only I trained in, during the years some 150 enterprise facilitators working in all these communities in, around the world, straight in New Zealand, United States, Canada, England, Scotland, Cornwall, Wales, the Congo, <laughs> Brazil, Mexico, Ecuador. But they trained trainees of theirs. So they, my trainees, trained enterprise facilitators. Guess what? They couldn't find anybody who passionately, equally loved to do it, to sell it, and look after the money. What do you mean you cannot find anybody like that? Say, no, Ernesto, we do what you do. You know, we tell them, do what you love to do. Find somebody who loves to do what you hate. We form teams all the time. Because we can never find the perfect entrepreneur. So I'm thinking, well, then we live in a parallel universe. Because every single glossy magazine about entrepreneurs describes precisely the men that we have never met. <laughs> so what gives here? Is it possible that we are so unlucky that we never met this person, this face? I decided to go to conferences and I started to ask people in the audience, do you know anybody who passionately equally loves to do it, to sell it, and to keep the books? And as soon as I would ask, people would start looking up. Never met. The people meet, people tell me that they know somebody who does it all. Yeah, but does he love it? And finally, one day, I had enough. After all, I can do research. So I was in Minnesota, I was in the city of St. Paul. I locked myself in a phenomenal library, public library. And I decided to get books about entrepreneurs. Because I needed to find out. Could it be that this glossy magazine are selling us a lot of bullshit. <coughs> I need to find out. So I got 100 companies and I looked at what happened in the basement, in the kitchen, when the company was started. And I looked at the iconic companies from Ford to GM to Disney to, to Heinz to Nike to Boeing. Uh, to, to Virgin, I looked at um, everybody. Intel, Microsoft, Yahoo, eBay, Amazon, uh, you name it. They're company companies. And I tried to find a book that was the contemporary, written at that time. Okay? Possibly by people who actually set up the company themselves or were very, very, very close to the founder. You know what I discovered? It's only one thing that the best companies in the world have in common. None 
was started by one person. It's not true. 